Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. If you have your Bibles, if you will turn with me this morning to the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. Ephesians, the fourth chapter. We've been talking about the wonder of forgiveness, and today we're going to bring to a close this series that we're uh, currently in. We've been talking about the wonder of forgiveness, and today we want to look at making forgiveness final. We've been talking about the most powerful force in our life, and that's the power of forgiveness. You know, the Bible tells us that Jesus had a lot to say about forgiveness. Mark 11 and verse 25 says, when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him. Luke 6 and 37, forgive and you will be forgiven. Matthew 6 and verse 12, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That prayer is really, Lord, forgive me the way I have forgiven others. Lord, treat me with the same mercy and the same grace that I've extended to other people in my life. It's really the principles of Christ's message. I will be forgiven the way that I forgive others. Last week, we found in the scriptures how the word tells us that if we want forgiveness from God, we must forgive our brothers and our sisters. This week, we want to talk about how to make that final. How do I live out the process of forgiveness? Friend, it's one thing to say, you know what? I forgive you. It's another thing to live that thing out day after day after day. And that's what we want to look at. How do we do that in the process of forgiveness? Ephesians chapter 4 is where we're heading, starting in verse 29. This morning, I want to encourage you, you can leave your Bibles open. We're going to walk through this passage together. Ephesians 4 and 29 begins there. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Verse 31 begins to give us some characteristics of unforgiveness. What does unforgiveness look like? If unforgiveness were to be exemplified in my life and in your life, what would it look like? Well, the Bible says the first way it looks is bitterness. And we're challenged by the Word of God to get rid of all bitterness. Now, bitterness is the opposite of sweetness and kindness. Bitterness harbors resentment, and bitterness always keeps a record of of wrongs. Bitterness is an irritable state of mind. Bitterness can lead you and I to a harsh opinion of others. It can also be defined as sourness of the soul. Have you ever met somebody that was just a sour individual? Looked like they've been sucking on lemons all day long. They're just sour. And then the words that begin to come out of their life portrayed that sourness. Things that characterize bitterness are resentment and harshness, acid on the heart, a mean scowl on the face, venom in our words. Bitterness is an inward decay of the soul. It poisons the inner man. It robs you and I of life, passion, strength, and vitality. What lemon is to the mouth, bitterness is to the heart. Aristotle once said this, bitterness is the resentful spirit 
that refuses reconciliation. Bitterness is the resentful spirit that refuses reconciliation. The person of bitterness has been robbed of the passion of life. Bitterness can lead to negativity in life. There are are some folks you're going to cross paths with in this life that they're just negative about everything. You know, you can say, you know what? Yesterday was beautiful weather. And they'll say, yeah, but we had rain all week long. You can say, isn't it a beautiful sunny day? Yeah, but I hear there's bad weather on the horizon. There's some folks, it doesn't matter what you say, they can't find anything positive in their lives to say. Someone has once said about bitterness and unforgiveness that bitterness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. If we're going to live in the process of forgiveness, friend, the Bible says we've got to get rid of all bitterness. May we be set free from bitterness and may our hearts and our lives live in freedom once again like the offense never, ever happened. Next, the passage goes on to say, get rid of all rage. What is rage? Rage is wrath. Rage and wrath is a deep, settled indignation. It's a constant flow and a constant form of flowing anger. One of the things that we like to do when often we go maybe camping as a family or maybe you're having a family gathering is often we'll, in the summertime, we'll have a campfire. Isn't it amazing how men like to play with fire? The truth is there's not a whole lot of difference between our kids and us guys. Any guy that's out there, if there's a fire, we've got to fix it. If there's a fire going, we can make it bigger. We can make it burn hotter. We can make it burn brighter because we're men and we know we're Lord of the flame. We've got this thing down. Have you ever heard words from maybe it was your mother when you're growing up or your second mother when you got married? who said, be careful, you're going to get yourself burned. I remember as a kid, my mom telling me, I got the bright idea. We were camping one time, and I got the bright idea. I was going to jump over the fire ring. My mom said, you better not do that. You're going to get burnt. I said the famous words, don't worry, mom. It'll be okay. Until I came down, and the back of my calf caught the edge of the fire ring, and I got burnt. My mom was right. The truth is, You play with fire, what? You're going to get burned. Wrath and rage. Wrath and rage stoke the fire of unforgiveness in our heart. It's like blowing on the fire, stoking it, making sure that the flame never dies. It's always feeding the fire. It's always keeping the fire of unforgiveness alive in your heart. Friend, unforgiveness will bring wrath. We don't often want to be that way. But it's a trap that we get settled into when we get caught in the act of unforgiveness. Now, it doesn't say get rid of rage and wrath. But the Bible says get rid of anger. Anger is an outburst of rage. It's the glass that gets thrown across the room. It's the fist that gets pounded on the desk. It's the hand that goes through the door. It's the phone clicking in your ear on the other line. Unforgiveness is the origin that stirs and causes anger. We don't want people in our life to feel like they got to walk on eggshells around us. We don't want people in our life to feel like they've got to stand at a distance in our life because they're afraid of what might set you off. Friend, this is not the thought of a momentary anger. How many of y'all ever been angry? Lift your hand. I've been angry before. We're not talking about just a momentary thing that makes us angry. But rather, this is a deep-seated anger that stems from the spirit of unforgiveness. It's because of what they've done to me. Have you ever used the phrase, they just bring it out in me? 
God's call to us is to get rid of all anger. Don't give it a chance, friend, to work in your life. Don't give it a chance to get settled in your heart. Get rid of all anger. Do yourself a favor. Do a favor for the people around you. And do a favor for the person who needs to be forgiven. Get rid of all anger. Next he goes on in our passage to say, get rid of all brawling. Now these next few characteristics are the ways that we vent unforgiveness. Friend, I can tell you this, the Bible is clear. What's in the heart is going to come out. These next few characteristics are the way that unforgiveness in the heart gets vented out in our life. Brawling is with our words. Brawling is characterized by shouting, uncontrolled speaking. You're going to hear it whether you want to hear it or not. It's the outward manifestation of of inward anger. It has been defined as evil speaking. Brawling is when things get out of control with my words. Next, it goes on to say, not only brawling, but get rid of all slander. Slander is blasphemous in nature. Words that are intended to injure. It is the cold, calculated use of our words. I'm going to say this, and I don't care who hears it, and I don't care who it hurts. They'll just have to get over it because I'm frustrated today. Words that are used to tear down. How often in for unforgiveness do we slander the person who has offended us? How often do we slander them? By continuing to relive, to tell and retell the story of how they've offended us. When in reality, if we were to look at the motive of our heart, often the motive of our heart is just to make them look bad to somebody else. Slander. Friends, slander is what our enemy does to us. The Bible talks about he's the accuser or the slanderer of God's people. He is speaking with the intention to tear down another. The Bible goes on to say not only get rid of brawling and slander, but get rid of every form. And you'll notice how clear that passage is there. It says get rid of every form of malice at the end of verse 31. Now malice, malice is the outcome of these other characteristics. Malice has been defined as bad heartedness. Malice is hatred in the heart. Malice says, I won't let this thing go. I have every right to feel the way I feel. I have every right to act this way. And I have every right to speak like I'm speaking. Friend, you and I can be, uh, we can be right, and yet at the same time, we can be oh so wrong. We can think we've got the, the seal on rightness, and yet we can be 100% wrong humanly speaking it's understandable why you feel the way you feel listen i'm not over a spiritualized in this thing when somebody offends us it hurts that's why they call it an offense it offends you it hurts you sometimes it'll break your heart sometimes it'll make tears flow down your face sometimes it'll make you in a moment be angry Those are normal outcomes. But, you know, friend, um, when we come to this place and we say, you know what, I understand how you feel. Listen, just because we understand doesn't make it excusable. Just because we understand why we may want to say those things and act those way, the Bible doesn't say we're excused to do those things. It's not good for you. It's not right for you. And the truth is, most importantly, it's not God's will for our lives. God is calling you and I to remove all these things that are not promoting health to my body, health to my spirit, health to my mind. 
These things, friend, will rot you and I through and through. They are the characteristics of unforgiveness. And if we're going to live out forgiveness in our lives, these things are going to have to go. Because, friend, you won't be able to walk in freedom from that thing if you keep harboring these things inside. That's why the Bible says, get rid of them. You know, we're right now, it's springtime. Spring makes us all want to get out and clean out the garage and the shed. It's amazing the things that pile up all through the winter and, frankly, all through our lives. Paul and I recently, we've been going through things and we think, man, we can get rid of some more. We can get rid of some more. We have, uh, Goodwill loves us. We have stocked their shelves again and again and again. There's a time when you've got, you've got so many things that say, you've got to say, you know what, it's time to get rid of some of this stuff. Friend, there's so much stuff that can get packed in my life and in your life. So many things packed in our minds and in our hearts. The Bible says it's time to get rid of that. You've been holding on to it for too long. Man, I've got stuff in the garage the other day. I, I, one of the things that my dad handed down to me was my dad would find a, 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 an extra bolt or a nut and he'd say, I'm going to keep that. I might need that one day. I can't tell you how many times I heard growing up, my mom would say, you need to get rid of that. And it, he'd just resound back my dad and say, yeah, but I might need it tomorrow. And then tomorrow, if he used it, he'd come back and say, see, I told you I was going to have to use that thing again. <laughs> I'm kind of like that way in my life. Things that I've held on to. And the other night I was out in the garage and I said, you know what, this is ridiculous. I've had this stuff for years. It's time for it to go. Friend, unforgiveness works in your heart that way. Listen, you can pack that thing away and you can hold it in there. But listen to me. It's time to let it go. God has greater things in store for your life. God wants to take you to higher levels in him. God wants you to live in freedom and purity of heart. Friend, it's time to get rid of all these things. Now let's go on a little bit. Verse 32. If we look at the characteristics of unforgiveness, verse 32 gives us some characteristics of forgiveness. Verse 32 says, be kind. Friend, the call of Jesus Christ for us is to be kind to the person who has wronged us, offended us, or sinned against us. It has been said before, as your actions change, your feelings will change. As your actions change, your feelings will change. So how do I start the process of living out forgiveness. Listen, be kind to the person that you're struggling to forgive. Be kind to them. Be kind to, being kind is the opposite of being harsh. It's the opposite of bitterness. It's the opposite of sharpness. Kindness is gracious. It's benevolent. It's affable. It's courteous and humble. Kindness is at the very heart of the love of God. Lynn, listen, with no exceptions, and I want you to underscore that in your mind. With no exceptions, show kindness to that person. It will be part of the process for you and I to walk in forgiveness. Sometimes we get the idea, well, if I'm kind to them, they'll just think I've let them off the hook. If I'm kind to them, then, you know, they may just want to come back and, and do it again. And they may think I'm just glossing over this thing and really not making it a big deal. Isn't that what forgiveness is about? We're supposed to act like it's never even happened. We're supposed to release them and forgive them. You see, in kindness, we're forgiving the way that God does. In God's forgiveness, he treats you and I as though it never happened. I'm so grateful to know he never brings up my past to me. He doesn't say, you know what, Jerry, I've got this date down. You may not remember it, but I remember it. He doesn't say any of that. In fact, I've often thought when I went back in prayer and I said, Lord, I need you to forgive me for that again. I've often wondered if God was sitting in heaven and going, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. I don't remember anything you've ever done before. Isn't that the way we want to be forgiven? That's how we want God to be in our lives. And friend, that is how he is in our lives. And you and I are the most like Jesus when we forgive the way that he forgives. 
You see, different actions will lead to different feelings, not the other way around. If you're waiting until you feel kindness towards the person, guess what? It's probably never going to happen. You've got to plant some seed if you want to have a harvest. Right now, the farmers, they've been out. Some of them got out in the fields before all the rain came. As soon as it dries up, they're going to get in the fields again. They're going to plant seed. It won't be long. Corn will be springing up. Soybeans will be springing up. You see, there'll come a time of harvest this fall. Friend, you won't get the harvest of forgiveness unless you plant the seed of kindness. You're planting seed in anticipation of what you're going to get back. What we really need in this issue is healing. Isn't that what forgiveness is all about? Healing, healing on the inside, and healing on the outside. Not only does he say, be kind, he goes on in verse 32, and he says this, be compassionate. Another word for compassionate is tender-hearted. Have you ever had something that you were harboring against another person? And sometimes they don't even know you're harboring it. You've been offended. Maybe, let's just be real for a minute. They looked at you a certain way and you were offended, by the way. Or maybe they walked by you in the church and they didn't shake your hand. And you thought, well, who am I? They just walked right by me and totally ignored me this morning. And you've held things against them. And every time you see me, you think, well, that's the person there that doesn't shake my hand anymore. And so that come up to you the next Sunday. And friend, you are as nice as can be. But inside you're going, yeah, yeah, you're the person who never sh shakes my hand. And you're harboring something against them and they don't even know what they've done. Listen, compassionate and tender-hearted has everything to do with the inside of you. Tender-hearted is about the heart change. Being compassionate is about what's in your heart. Because notice this, God does not look at the outward appearance as man does. But where does God look? God looks at our hearts. Tender-hearted means ready to feel the pain of another person. That's a good description, isn't it? Tender-hearted is ready to feel the pain of another person. When we've been hurt, what we usually do is we close our hearts towards that person. Being compassionate and tender-hearted is opening our heart back up to that individual. May God give each of us a spirit of a tender heart. Man, friends, we live in a world that is so harsh, so hard, so critical. If there's anything that ought to characterize the people of God, and let me bring that down a little bit more. If there's anything that ought to characterize a forgiven people, it should be that we're tender hearted towards others. People say, well, you got to toughen up a little bit. you got to toughen up. Listen, there's nobody more tough than my God is. And God is so tender-hearted. He's so kind. There's nobody more. Probably you say, you know what? I've got to keep up this, this look. And I've got people to, to think, you know, I want them to think a certain way about me. Listen, God is compassionate. God is kind. God is merciful to everyone. God wants to change our hearts, friend. Listen to the words of Romans 12. 9 and 10. Verse number 9 says, don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring one another. That's a good passage right there. I want to challenge you this week. Take delight in honoring other people. When you go to work tomorrow, take delight in honoring your boss, even if he's not your favorite boss. Take delight in honoring your coworkers, even if they're driving you crazy. Let me bring it down a little closer. Take delight this week in honoring your spouse or your family or your friends. Husbands, take delight in honoring your wife this week. Wives, take delight. Get excited about honoring your husband. Verse 14 there in Romans 12 goes on. It says, bless those who persecute you. 
don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them. Never pay back evil with more evil, verse 17 says. Do things in such a way, this one is big. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Listen, if you go to work tomorrow and you complain about the boss and everybody else like everybody else is doing, they may wonder what you even got when you went to church yesterday. The Bible says do things in such a way that everyone, listen, at work, everyone at home can see that you're honorable. Verse 18, do all that you can. This is a big deal. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. One of the translations renders that verse this way. As much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Verse 19 says, dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge and I will pay them back, says the Lord. Verse 20, instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Listen, the Bible's call for you and I is to be compassionate and tender-hearted in forgiveness. Now, next, I want us to look at verse 32 at the end of it. It says, forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. I want to give you some help to be able to forgive and walk this thing out. I want you to think for a moment, if you will, about the forgiveness that God gives us. Think about the words he's spoken to us. Think about how he's acted towards us. The words that I would use to describe his forgiveness for us is immediate and complete. When you come to Christ, friend, you don't have to wait a few days for him to make a decision whether he's going to forgive you or not. It's all over. That's the wonder of forgiveness. Man, folks, it's powerful. In my sin, I can say, Lord, forgive me. And it's immediate. And not only is it immediate, but it's complete through and through. He completely forgives me. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He throws them into the sea of forgetfulness. He chooses not to remember them any longer. The reality is Christ forgives immediately. Why does he do that? Because the work has already been done on the cross. You see, your salvation and my salvation was purchased, paid for, in full, 2,000 years ago, when on an old rugged cross, Jesus Christ uttered the words, It is finished. The good news for you is the work was done before you were even born. Your forgiveness was made complete before you even sinned the first time. Jesus died for your transgressions before you and I could even commit the first sin. It is finished. It is finished. But I want you to notice something. The work is finished, but the forgiveness isn't made reality until repentance takes place in my life. You see, there are two positions to take in forgiveness. It's the vertical and the horizontal. Forgiveness works in two ways. Between us and God and between us and man. The vertical is when we forgive people in Christ. What does that mean? We go to the Father and we say, Father, I choose to lay this thing down. Father, listen, friends, God knows. Have you ever had somebody hurt you and you try to tell somebody the story and they just don't seem as passionate about your situation as you do? I mean, you're just fit to be tied. And they can't even get worked up over it. 
You're telling your story and, and what you in your heart are really want. You're wanting somebody to pat you on the back and go, wow, they are really a dirty dog. And boy, they don't even deserve to. Boy, God ought to just smoke them right there. Isn't that how we want to feel? And it's kind of like, I don't get that you're not getting what I'm telling you. Sometimes they just don't grasp what's going on in the situation. Listen, God the Father was there when it happened. You see, he even knows more about your situation than you know. You heard the words, but God the Father knew the motive that they spoke the words with. There's nothing about your situation he's not aware of. He knows more about it than even you do. Listen, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died on the cross. He did the work of forgiveness so that you and I, when we sin, we have an advocate with God the Father, Jesus Christ, who is sitting next to the Father's right hand. So how, does, how do we do this thing? How do we live it out? Listen, friend, when somebody offends you, the first place you need to go is to God. God, I have this problem. God, you saw it. God, you know how it made me feel. God, you know the situation. And God, I lay this thing down at your feet. And friend, before God, we need to forgive that person and we need to release that person. You need to, re before God, release them from the obligation that resulted from the offense. This part must transpire and happen before the other part can take place. You must release them before God because you may never, listen, you may never have the opportunity to make it right with that person. You may never see them again. It may be somebody who's died and gone on into eternity. Listen, the vertical is between you and God. You've got to release that person. You've got to say, Lord, I forgive them. Lord, I lay it down on the altar. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I release them. Next is the horizontal. That's between you and the person who's caused the offense. Forgiveness with that person, though, listen to me, can't transpire until there's been repentance. When you go to a person and you say, you know what, I forgive you for what you've done, before they've repented, you have just cheapened the power of forgiveness. They may not know they've even done anything to you to cause an offense, or they may not care some of y'all come across those folk. They don't care that they created an offense with you. Notice how God works with us. The work is accomplished. We come in repentance. Forgiveness is granted, and we're released. You see, God doesn't work that way with us. God doesn't come to you and I and say, you know what? I know you've had a bad attitude, and I just want you to know I forgive your attitude. You've been acting really bad lately, but I just want you to know, I forgive you for acting that way. You know, you've been treating people wrong. You've been treating your spouse really, really bad. But I just want you to know, hey, don't worry about it. People will be people. I forgive you. No worries. God doesn't work that way with us. The work of forgiveness was done on the cross. It had already been completed on God's part. Now, he was just waiting on you and I to come in repentance. You and I don't find forgiveness with God until what? We repent. You have to take it in this order because, friend, listen, sometimes the offender will never come back to you to make it right, but you still have to forgive them. Sometimes they aren't even aware they've offended you. Have you ever had somebody come to you and say, you know what, I just want you to know, six months, three days, five hours, and ten minutes ago, you really hurt me by what you said. And you're like, I have no idea what you're even talking about. And they say, well, I just want you to know for all this time, I've been bitter at you, I've been angry with you, you don't know you've done it, that's fine. But I'm telling you, you did it. And I just want you to know, I forgive you. How many of you know there's something wrong with that story? 
Listen, unless you deal with the vertical first, this is real important. Unless you deal with the vertical first, you will not be ready to release them when they do come to you. Last week, I showed you a backpack. I grabbed Colton's backpack before service. And I carried it around during the sermon. And I talked about these things in the backpack. These are offenses we've carried around. Listen, if you don't get this thing resolved between you and God, if they do come back to repent, here's what you're going to do. You're going to take the backpack off and you're going to put it on them. Friend, you've got to have it released. The Bible says, forgive each other as God forgave you in Christ Jesus. How did he do that? Lord, I've sinned against you. I'm sorry. And he immediately forgives me and sets me free. Listen, you and I are most like Jesus when we resolve this thing vertically. And then when the time the horizontal comes, we immediately can release that person and say, in Jesus' name, friend, you are released as if it's never ever happen but you will not be able to do that if you haven't released them with God when you've forgiven them with God then if they come to you you're able to quickly forgive and release them just as Christ was quick to forgive you the scripture is true forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you so how do we live out this process while we're waiting on them to return and repent? The Bible's clear. Get rid of all unforgiveness. Get rid of bitterness. Get rid of rage and anger and slander and every kind of malice. Decide to treat them with kindness and be tenderhearted. These, listen, friend, these are choices on your part. Because remember, the scripture said, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Friend, we've got to yield that thing to the Father. And then when there are days and moments that we are tempted to relive it, we want to go back and, and just relive and rehash that story, friend. That's the time we go back and we say, Father, I'm so sorry for entertaining that stuff again. I gave that to you, and I want you to keep it. I don't want to carry that stuff any longer. Friend, that's how we can live out forgiveness. Because some of you... You may have the opportunity for that person, and you may be able to mend that relationship through repentance and forgiveness. But even if it doesn't happen, you and I one day are going to stand before God. And the truth is, before I even get to that day, there may come another time I need forgiven. And God knows whether I've forgiven or not. I need to release them. As I was thinking about how to close this morning, I wanted to challenge you in closing with this thought and this passage that comes from Psalm 51. David said these words, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Friend, this whole issue of unforgiveness and forgiveness has to do with our heart. The Bible says, from the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Your life will follow suit with what's in your heart. I don't know about you, but I need a continual washing of my heart. I need a continual washing in my life. God, create in me a clean heart. I don't want there to be any part dark in my heart. I don't want any little part of my heart reserved in darkness for maybe some old bitterness, some old hurts, some old offenses. I want to live free. I want to be clean in my heart towards God. Would you stand with me this morning? Paul, if you'll come. Right where you're at, I want us to pray together. I want us to pray together the prayer that the psalmist David prayed in this passage. That God will clean our hearts. The Bible says that we can trust him to look into our hearts and he will expose the things that are there. Friend, he knows you and I better than we know ourselves. I don't trust my estimation of Jerry. 
but I do trust his. This morning, I want us to pray together, right? Just right where you're at with your own words, your own way. Creating me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. God, make me tenderhearted. Give me a new heart. Friend, if your heart is hardened by things you've walked through in life, ask him to give you a new heart, a tender heart, a heart that is compassionate and kind. Ask him to give you whatever you may need. As your heads are bowed, I'm going to lead us in prayer. Would you pray that prayer individually for yourself today? Father, today as you look upon us in this place, Lord, would you just create in us a clean heart? Would you create in us a pure heart? God, would you create in us a clean heart, Lord, where there's no part dark, no part that we've reserved for unforgiveness and bitterness. No part of our heart that we've reserved for rage and anger and malice. Father, would you come in today and would you just wash us? Lord, wash our hearts and make us clean. And Lord, as you do that, would you, would you give us a right spirit? Not only create us a clean heart, but God, would you restore to us a right spirit, right heart, right ways. God, I guess what I'm asking today is, Lord, you'll just make us right before you on the inside. Because, Lord, if we're right on the inside, the outside's going to follow suit. So, Lord, would you just do a washing in us? Would you just do a cleansing in us? Would you just do a purifying in us, I pray. Lord, I trust you because this is not something we could do on our own. All we can do is come to you and ask you. And so, Lord, we ask in faith today that you'll create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Father, we pray these things in the name of Jesus. And, Father, I pray for the men and women standing in this room today that are wrestling with unforgiveness. God, help them as they walk this path. Lord, it's time to let this thing go. It's time to get rid of this so we can move on in the life you have for us to live. I pray, Father, they'll take your word to heart. And, Lord, we'll learn, we'll learn to live out a life of forgiveness. Lord, I pray it today to be so, and I ask it all in your name, the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Now, as we close, a final closing, I'd like, you know, friends, we come together and I don't know what your week's been like and you probably don't know what my week's been like. But sometimes a week can bring a whole lot of things into our life. And I want to be able to close our time. That if there's any of you today, you just got a need in your life, no matter what it is, physical, financial, spiritual, relational. Friend, maybe you've been faced with something and this week you've been worrying you've been anxious maybe some of y'all going through some tough times and it's just kind of like a really heavy weight on your shoulders we'd love to have the opportunity to pray with you today we'd love to have the opportunity to believe God today to be with you and help you and so Paula's going to sing and if she does friend if you just like special prayer you just have a need in your life friend this is your church if you've got a need in your life and you'd like to have somebody pray with you would you just come and allow us the opportunity, the honor to pray with you today? If you've got a need, would you come as they sing? Thank you, Jesus.